Hello once again, it's Joe the CRM chap here and we're back with a new video in my series all about Microsoft Exam PL600. This is the Solution Architect Exam for those who find themselves building or architecturing different uh, applications that are built on top of the Power Platform. So in today's video we're going to be taking a look at the Power Platform Admin Center. Now this is a really central location that we will typically as Solution Architects be working with quite a lot. It gives us the main interface that we can use to work with the different environments that we set up and also configure other different admin settings that we can uh, work with across our different instances or across our different deployments whether it's a Dataverse database or whether it's something like Power Automate or Power Apps. So we can navigate and get into the Power Platform Admin Center by going to admin.powerplatform.microsoft.com and then when we navigate to here for the first time we'll see a list of all the different environments that we've got access to. Um, it also gives us the mechanism to go in and create new environments if we wanted to. So maybe if we want to have a new sandbox environment that we want to do some maybe some dev or test work, we can follow the interface over here to basically set up and create that new environment at any point. For an existing environment such as maybe my PL600 one, we can see at the top, I can click into it and I can see I've got access to a variety of different options on here. So in this particular case, this is a sandbox environment that I've got uh, over here. I can see the most recent operations down here, so when it was created as an example. Uh, I can go in and maybe edit some of these settings, so perhaps maybe if I want to adjust the URL on here, maybe I want to enable administration mode so that only administrators can access and go into the Dataverse environment. And what I can also do as well is set, up, set it up so that only members of a particular security group will be given access into this particular environment. Uh, typically, we'd want to always try and uh, set up security groups particularly these days because with our uh, business premium, with our E3 licenses, they by default give access to Dataverse. So it could be that for large organizations, we find that our environment has got every single user created in there. By using security groups, we can hopefully control that and we can limit who's got access into that. Moving on from there, we can go in and start to work with some environment-specific settings. Uh, so for example, we can go in and maybe see the list of all the different users who have got access into this environment currently. We can maybe add additional ones in there. We can maybe assign them different security roles. Uh, we can view environment specific settings. Um, and this may be important if we're wanting to enable perhaps new features or preview features that haven't quite gone live yet. So we can click onto the behavior tab up here and we can see uh, we can enable different sort of behaviors. Also on the features tab, we'll have access to be able to do things such as maybe enabling or disabling Power BI visualization, Bing Maps capability. Uh, the ability to uh, enable the TDS endpoint if we wanted to query Dataverse using SQL, a variety of different settings here that we need to be familiar with and we may need to, on occasion, go in and modify to suit our particular uh, requirements or scenario. Now, environments can uh, also have other actions um, executed against them. So we can, for example, uh, promote our sandbox environment into a production uh, and also vice versa as well. Uh, we can take a backup of our environment at any, at any particular point. Uh, Microsoft will automatically create backups for us behind the scenes, and we can do uh, point-of-time restores, but it might also be advisable if we're doing, for example, maybe a solution upgrade or something like that, that we take our own backups. Uh, depending on whether it's a sandbox or production environment, the backup will be retained for different lengths as part of that. Finally, we can also look to reset our environment. We can maybe copy it to a new location and also delete it as well. Now, notice some of these options won't be enabled for if this environment is a production environment, for example. Um, so this is more of a sort of a safety thing. You know, we don't want to have it so that it's very easy for us to go in and delete a production environment. So typically the process that we need to follow is that we first of all just um, downgrade our production environment into a sandbox and then we'll find that those options are made available to us. So that covers off some of the things that we can do from an environment level with uh, the Power Platform Mapping Center. Uh, other things we can do is we can view a variety of useful analytic data covering our different services. So as an example for Microsoft Dataverse, we can click into here. Uh, and then for any particular environment, I can see a variety of useful stats. I can see, for example, how many users are in this environment, number of API operations, uh, how are different sort of uh, tables or entities being used in the system, you know, what's consuming the most potentially from a storage standpoint and also from a uh, from an action standpoint, so we can see uh, the number of different uh, CRUD, create, read, update, and delete actions against this. We can get a bird's eye view in terms of how our plugins are performing, again, see any different errors on there, 
and also as well view our API uh, calls as well. Now this is particularly important if um, if we are um, for any administrator, or indeed maybe even for solution architect as well, to uh, review this on occasion, particularly maybe in when our solution is maybe in early development stages. Uh, API calls um, can potentially impact us based on the number of licenses that we've got. So if it's a case that we've got uh, not enough licenses, it could be that potentially Microsoft will throttle us uh, and restrict us to the number of different API calls we can do on a day-to-day -day basis. So therefore going into here and actually seeing what's going on uh, can be quite useful, particularly if, as we are gearing up our solution to go live, uh, uh, um, you know, and particularly also if it involves Microsoft Dataverse. Uh, moving on from there, we can then go in and view details about our different capacity across the board. And this will show us a nice view at the tenant level in terms of what we've got available to us. So I can see in this case that across my entire Microsoft 365 tenant, I've got a total of 10.5 uh, gigabytes of database storage that I can use. Then aside that, I can store up to 24 gigabytes of file data. And this will be data that we upload maybe as part of a note or an attachment. And then log data, I've got two gigabytes that I can consume as part of that. So the numbers we see here will be dictated largely by what type of licenses we've got in place. Uh, and the more licenses that we have, potentially the more storage we'll have. And we can also look to purchase additional add-on capacity as and when we need to. From a Dataverse standpoint, we can go in and view at a very detailed level in terms of which environments are consuming the most from a storage standpoint. And this will allow us to direct our attention towards potential environments that we may need to just tidy up or potentially even remove if it's a case that we're consuming far too much storage. Uh, we can view some information about the number of different Dataverse for Teams environments that we've got set up uh, and again how much storage they're consuming. Now add-ons is where we may need to go on occasion particularly if we are consuming uh, things such as maybe a portal uh, capacity add-on or maybe looking to have our um, have our if you've got maybe our, a per app um, uh, sort of uh, license scheme in place because uh, rather than going into the Microsoft 365 admin center and applying these on, we would instead need to go into the Power Platform Admin Center. And then from here, based on the number of different passes that we've got available to us, the number of different licenses that have been provisioned for our, for our particular tenant, we'll be able to go on here and then just assign this accordingly. So typically it may be a two-step process from a setup standpoint. First, we just need to maybe go into the Microsoft 365 Admin Center, assign licenses to users, then go into the Power Platform Admin Center, and then assign on any additional capacity or add-ons that we may have purchased as well. And we would typically do this on a per environment level as well. If we're wanting to consume one or maybe multiple different uh, Dynamics 365 applications, uh, we can click this button down here and get a nice view of all the different apps that are available to install on our particular tenant. Then if we're interested in maybe, for example, install, installing uh, one of these particular uh, applications, then what we would need to do is go into our environments click into it like so, we can see we've got a button at the top when we select it called resources. And when we click on here, we can then see and then install any particular app that we want from the list of available options we can see over here. Uh, other things we can do in the Power Platform Admin Center, we can actually log a ticket at any particular time. Uh, so all we just need to do is just go to help and support. We can then log a support request uh, uh, provide some details about what our issue relates to, uh, if we've got any sort of uh, premier support contracts or other support contracts in place with Microsoft, we can tie those into as part of logging the support request and they'll then go off to Microsoft to be uh, to be looked at and, we'll, uh, and they'll get in touch with us as soon as possible. Data integration allows us to manage our different uh, projects that we've set up to maybe look to, that look to push data out into external sort of systems. So from here, we get a dashboard type view that, that allows us to see the health of our particular data integration, you know, when, when the, it last ran, uh, any potential errors or issues and things like that. In the case of my environment or my tenant over here, I've got nothing uh, set up currently. So this screen is all blank at the moment, but we can just go in at any point and create a brand new project fairly straightforwardly. Under the data preview tab, we can see some information about the different gateways that we may have installed in our environment. Um, so if we've got, for example, uh, one or several different on-premise data gateways, we can see them all down here and we can manage some details about them, uh, including who can access them. Uh, this gives us an alternate way of managing them. Uh, previously, we may uh, look to go into the Power BI portal to do this instead. And under policies down here, the most important thing that we can also look to work with uh, is our data loss prevention policies. And as a solution architect, we'll need to consider very carefully in terms of, in terms of what 
uh, data policies will need to configure uh, to ensure that um, you know potential connectors are not used by end users and therefore causes problems. So as an example, maybe we want to ensure that uh, users building flows in our environments can't connect out to their personal OneDrive account um, and you know potentially export data out of our SQL database into that. Uh, with our data policies, what we can do is we can specify, first of all, a name for it. Uh, so I'll just call this my DLP policy, like so. We can see a list of all the different connectors that we want to class as maybe business or non-business and also block any particular connectors that we uh, don't want in our environment. So it could be maybe that for this particular one, uh, Office uh, 365 Outlook, we want to maybe move it to business. Uh, maybe we want to sc scroll down a bit further, maybe go to Dropbox and maybe block that as a connector. And we just go in and just configure all the various different connectors that we want to that we want to potentially block or classify in here. Uh, we also get the option as well being able to block and control how people can use custom connectors, which might be worth looking at if we have implemented some of those into our environment. And then finally, we can then sort of uh, provide some indication in terms of how we want this data loss prevention policy to apply, and we can do this uh, you know globally across our entire tenant. Uh, on a specific environment per environment basis, or we could also exclude specific environments from applying to this DLP policy. Then once it's set up, the policy will take effect straight away. And what will happen is that users who potentially go in and build a flow that use connectors that aren't allowed by organization, they'll get an immediate error that's presented to them that will block them from saving and building out the flow with the connectors that they're using. So this, in a nutshell, gives you an overview in terms of what we can do with the Power Platform Admin Center. As the name sort of implies, it's typically something that maybe, you know, once we've gone live or, you know, on an ongoing basis, administrators in our organization will typically work with quite a lot. Uh, but the solution architect will often need to go in here. Um, it will give us a primary, the primary destination that we can use to configure many different aspects of our particular Power Platform deployment, uh, set up sort of core information points as well. And certainly from our own point of view, if we're wanting to see how our solution is, is developing, if we wanted to get a feel in terms of, okay, are we going to be okay potentially from an API consumption standpoint, then there's a variety of different very useful reports in here that we can look to leverage. So there is some value for us um, um, understanding what we've got in here and certainly a, a good expectation that we know the in, in, inside outs and the inner workings of this particular portal in, in quite sort of detail. So that pretty much wraps it up for this video today. So I hope you found this useful and indeed the other ones in the series so far. If you haven't subscribed to the channel uh, yet, um, uh, please do if you enjoyed the video and give the video and give it a like and a um, um, and 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 yeah, hopefully uh, there'll be other videos in the future that cover uh, other similar topics relating to this exam and other topics as well. So it'd be really great to have you along for the ride. Uh, so all I need to say is uh, have a great day and see you later. Cheers.